That's true. This is how I got into teratology. It's actually very recently. I just wanted to actually just get uh, hands of residents that are in the group. Excellent. Okay, so this is a lot of this is for you, and I'm actually really excited to see some residents in here because it was in my residency that I got introduced to the field of teratology, and just like Dr. Larson said, um, I was assigned on a maternal field management fellowship, and in doing so, was taking a couple of years off and put aside to work as a generalist. Um, and during that time, Anthony Shally, who, if you heard of Read for Talks, uh, who runs Read for Talks, uh, contacted me because he's one of our attendings and said, hey, I'm, in I'm interested in talking to you about doing a fellowship in teratology. Um, let me know if you're interested. It took me about 24 hours to answer because I don't really know what that is. <laughs> Like, well, I did, I had a sense of what it is, but I didn't exactly know what I was going to be doing. And so I answered to something to that effect, like, yeah, sure, let's, let's do this. This would be a good time to tell you that I don't know really the definition. So we started this uh, two-year fellowship stint that ended up being mostly nights and weekends because it's not an organized program. But I started being involved in a lot of the societies, like the Tarantago Society and the uh, Organization for Grads and Information Specialists. And I'll tell you a little bit more of that at the end of the talk. And um, Sort of, it's a good place to grow a, a career if you're interested. Uh, there's certainly a place for MDs in the group, uh, and I will sort of present you an opportunity at the end of the conversation here uh, in regards to how you can get involved. So this is meant to be a little bit of a discussion. I've been in situations where I've spoken, and the, the discussion turns into like a lot of silence. So I do have slides that we can talk about or I can tell you about. But certainly this is the time to sort of raise your hand or just speak out loud and it's supposed to be a conversation more than anything. So very simple cases uh, during lunch hour so that you don't fall asleep. So we'll talk about the first case. We'll talk about lead exposure in pregnancy. You'll hear a lot about that today. The first one is a very simple case and we'll see why. 32-year-old gravid of 4 pair 2012, 14 weeks and 6 days. Um, she's coming to you for her first prenatal appointment. She's originally from Mexico. In fact, she immigrated very recently to the United States and is currently living in her hometown in Detroit, Michigan. And she's working in a family print shop uh, where she has a decent amount of support, actually, uh, psychosocially. <coughs> and she is increasingly concerned about lead exposure in pregnancy because one of her cousins has been shown to have high lead exposure, uh, lead levels um, throughout her pregnancy. So, yeah, okay, fine, you're supposed to care. That's just a no brainer. Who cares? And that's actually the point. It's supposed to bring us to. What is it that you're really interested in knowing in a patient like this? So let me hear a little bit about you. What do you think? What are you interested in knowing in a patient like this? Right. Yeah. Um, like, but you actually know a lot about this. So you're not supposed to be the one that's answering. <laughs> okay, does she have a history of FICO? Everybody understands FICO, yes? Um, next, something else. when you go to Google, and you're like, oh my goodness, I don't know. I spent m most of my first year as an attending Googling a lot and going through websites trying to figure out some answers that I didn't know from residency, but good. Anything else? So is it a print shop like Kinko's, or is she like setting type? <laughs> that is, that's <coughs> excellent. Very, very good. Um, my father was in the printing business. We used to be in the art family, and so um, I spent a lot of my time in sort of the, the printing work and actually touching all those things only. That's why I needed IVF, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? Does she do any pottery or anything with her from there? That's excellent, perfect. Does she do any pottery as a hobby or as a job or as part of her job in the printing shop? Sometimes people have sort of different uh, types of um, uh, things that they work with in their, in their environment. So, right, this is sort of some of the questions I came up with. What would I want to know as part of her environment? What is she involved with? And we'll explain a little bit if you're not really sure where those exposures come from, how exactly that happens in, in a pregnancy. So yes, lead, this is sort of the periodic table. And this is just to show us the size of, of lead and how it easily diffuses across the placenta and why we're actually even here. So how can one be exposed to lead? Uh, I think we touched a little bit about this, but this is um, where the information for <coughs> came from, which is the maternal exposure to moonshine never had a patient with a maternal exposure to moonshine, you probably haven't either. So where are the real sources of lead in a patient's environment? Some very specific sources that are, you've heard it this morning, anybody? Paint, I heard something else? Pottery, we've talked about that. 
lead pipe breaks. So some of the common things that are really um, easy to think of. So any one of these dyes, and we talk about pottery glazes, that's really important because a lot of patients that have been involved with those who do pottery as, um, as a hobby, wood preservatives, anything that you can imagine that has to do with lead pipe. So I think this is a really interesting slide, which looks at a couple of different things. And as you see on the left, I'm not going to move this one actually, but um, the blood lead levels in the United States being in the green. And the good thing about this is the public health efforts have been really incredible in minimizing the amount of lead that we are exposed to during our pregnancies. And you'll see that sort of nice sloping down uh, after the 1970s. Well, the same thing as far as our definition of what is a lead exposure and what is too much lead in the bloodstream, well, you see from the 1970s also, that definition has gone down. And a lot of experts really think that no amount of lead is really inappropriate for uh, a fetus or a child or a pregnancy, uh, but this is sort of how far along we've gotten. So what are some of the exposure, some of the problems that are problematic with exposures of lead in pregnancy? Anything. What happens to a pregnancy? What are what are some of the associations that we find when somebody's exposed to, exposed to lead? Blood levels are high. What are the potential problems? So, no, nobody. <laughs> preterm birth and birth restriction. Yes, great. Preterm birth, birth restriction. What else? Anybody else? Anemia. Anemia. Great. Actually, that's a good one. That's not even on there. It's perfect. What else in terms of the pregnancy? Yes, pregnancy induced hypertension. I thought that was really fascinating. So let's talk a little bit about those. Um, right, so spontaneous abortion is one of those things as well. And it, we know that at high levels of lead exposure, that's certainly true. What we're not 100% sure about is the medium and the low level of lead exposure. How much does that contribute to spontaneous abortion? Well, um, there's a study out of, New, out of Mexico, actually, the country of Mexico, where it looks at even medium and uh, moderate levels of lead exposure. And there is sort of a uh, linear relationship, but other studies have looked at it and said, well, that's not really a linear relationship. Maybe there's more uh, interesting data and sometimes for the really prenatal um, high levels really early on in pregnancy, and does that sort of affect that, that pregnancy? Um, low birth weight, we talked about that. Neurodevelopmental effects, so we know that if we look at fetuses at 12 or 13 weeks of gestation, that their brain will actually have lead content, and we can see that. Um, anomalies, that's not really turned out all that great. There are certainly associations out there, but we, we like to see in teratology, like, you know, we love to see, say, give this drug and you get this anomaly. You give this drug and at least you're going to get, like, a type of malformation, like a chronotruncal or something. We don't really see that with lead. And then hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, it looks like there's an association there. But when that problem occurs and if it's dose-related and if it's a certain time of the, the pregnancy, is it like a dose exposure over a long period of time, that's all really goes into that question, and we still don't know the answer to that. So I adapted this from the Minnesota Department of Health, but a lot of departments of health have something of this sort, which is a questionnaire, right? It's like something that you're supposed to ask women when they're coming for their prenatal visit. Um, and this is very, very specific, very easy. You, you probably already know this, and this is nothing really you know, groundbreaking, but it gives you a little bit of a model of what you should be talking about to a patient. So we're going to use this as sort of a platform to talk about each individual uh, of those uh, questions. And the first three, we're going to talk about the first one and the last two, which is somebody in your household or yourself has an occupation that involves lead exposure. And that's a simple question, but sometimes patients may not know, and you may have to delve deeper. Excuse me. Or is somebody using cer certain hobbies that have lead exposure? And then if you are specifically involved with pottery or lead crystal. So these are sort of the industries, and it's actually, believe it or not, an abbreviated list of all the occupations and industries that are involved with lead and that could potentially be harmful to a pregnancy. And then what I was interested in was these hobbies because most of the patients that, you know, at least I used to see, are really not involved with certain like jobs that women don't have to do those jobs necessarily um, that have high levels of exposure, but then also these hobbies, and I've certainly had patients uh, that showed that. And Jewelry making is like making a comeback. Like everybody's making jewelry now. There's a kids are making jewelry. There's all these YouTube videos on jewelry. And, and this specific picture on sort of the second picture uh, with the metal jewelry looks like they were uh, taken off the market because there was a higher level of lead exposure than those children who were playing with these toys. 
Um, the next one I think they put down is the pottery because I did have uh, patients who were involved with pottery ceramic ware. Um, and the stained glass and, and painting on stained glass. And then the last one I included was the printmaking because I felt like I was involved with that my entire life. Okay, the second one is what we talked about, again, is pica. A lot of women have the sensation that they have to eat something that is not edible. Um, and they're very, very ashamed to tell you that. And they won't tell you that in fact, and even if you ask them more specifically. And sort of inadvertently, you end up finding out that they're eating talcum powder or something else that's really not appropriate. And then you have to decide whether or not they're appropriate to test for lead exposure. And then do you live in a house that's ongoing with remodeling, uh, renovations, things like that? A lot of patients that you find, you know, the younger generation, the 25, 27, the first time buying their own home, they can't afford a really new home, they get something from the 1950s, 1960s, you know, and are you um, sort of exposed in that environment uh, now during your pregnancy? And then to your knowledge, uh, has, has your water been tested for lead? And what's lead is high here is like 15 parts per billion. So that's sort of what you should be looking for in terms of a number. And then we'll spend a little bit more on time on this, which is the traditional folk remedies and cosmetics that are used in certain types of um, immigrants, especially in our community, actually, in New York City. And what are those cosmetics? So this one, I think, is very interesting. Something called coal. It's in the African and Asian population. Coal is the type of stuff where, if you have women that like, cover in your practice, it's the type of stuff they put on their eyes to make it like an eyeliner, like a very dark eyeliner. Very popular. It's used in rituals, uh, like a lot of women are using it to actually put it on the umbilical stump to dry it out. So it's used in children as well. Um, there are really reputable products in the market actually that um, look for lead content. Um, however, they're not considered good enough by the, you know, by the families. The, the really the having it homemade is considered much better, so people make it at home. How you make it is actually by grinding lead sulfide. In. That's how it's actually, that's what it is. So that's a, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> um, in Asian communities, you have things like um, brown, black bean type stuff, brown powder, red powder, certain powders that are really you know, prevalent in these populations, and they use it for intestinal disorders, so these things are actually ingested. And in the Latino community, we have a lot of this, and I live in West Harlem, and we have a lot of this up there, where you'll have things like azurcon, it's like a yellow or orange powder, it's used for abdominal pain, a lot of that happens in pregnancy, they end up using that during their pregnancy. And then um, something you know, a little bit more about with the, the Ayurvedic herbal medication. It's very popular in pregnancies and um, I was reading something actually just recently. In 2012, there's about 205 cases in the city area that were exposed to lead that had high le blood level um, contents of lead. And about eight of those cases were tracked back to, you know, coming from uh, a country very relatively east of, recent, like from India, and having medications or powders sent from back home that were supposed to help with the pregnancy, supposed to promote having a male child, things like that, um, that were used during a pregnancy and ended up having a tremendous amount of lead content. Only two to four percent of it was lead. And these blood levels ended up getting pretty high. Okay, so what are you supposed to do? Screening of women um, at the initial prenatal visit. You're supposed to talk to them about uh, a questionnaire, something you can come up with yourself. You can use something from the Department of Health. You can look at your Department of Health, where you're working, and what's required of you. Um, and then testing is appropriate. In New York City, it's mandated. We have to test everybody for a lens. So if you're, if you're there and you haven't gotten tested, you have to be like, I transferred here, I was pregnant, and I have to get my lead uh, level drawn. Um, and then anticipatory guidance. You're supposed to speak to everybody about anticipatory guidance. What do you find is a problem with this? Anybody? What's hard about this? I need time. Yeah. I mean, I was looking at my schedule, you know, two years back, and it's like my prenatal visit, you know, my first, you know, conception visit was, was just as long as the following visit on the computer screen, and you're supposed to do so much. I mean. We're spending a lot of time talking about lead. There's a lot of things you end up speaking to a woman that you want to get into their you know, information before you even start. And you don't have the time. It's really hard. So it's finding, finding a way to prioritize what you think is, is the most impact for those pregnancies. Um, and I think what, what I would end up doing, I have to admit, it wasn't like I was doing a questionnaire. I was like, badly. What is your occupation? What do you do for you? You're kind of like making chatter, and they, they think you're you know you're really involved in pregnancy, and so you're really trying to assess what kind of exposures do they have in their life. Okay, 
Um, and then what are you supposed to do with when you get a blood level? Let's see, say, okay, she's doing this. I know that this, she's exposed. Uh, let me check what her blood le or lead level is. Um, what are you supposed to do with that? There's a lot of uh, guidance out there. It's talking about the great bulletin out there. Um, I'm sorry, it's the opinion. Um, you can look at Reprotox, you can look at Terrace, you can look at organizations, Keratology, Strategy, and Information Specialists, all those things, and they'll give you sort of guidance what you're supposed to do. And so that we know that if less than five, even though most of us believe that you shouldn't have really any, less than one would be better. In fact, I think in the New York City, when you get a, a level, it's supposed to be less than one. But less than five, you're not really supposed to do any further testing. And anything above that, what you're supposed to do is provide nutritional information, provide support for the family, try to identify <coughs> where this blood exposure is coming from, and then you're supposed to get maternal samples, not only that, but also get cord blood samples at the time of delivery, inform the physicians that are taking care of this baby from then on. And then we'll touch a little bit on um, chelation therapy and what sort of uh, things you can do after a lead level is really high at greater than 40, 45, depending on what you read. So, okay, chelation therapy. You know, chelation therapy is great. You're like, okay, well, here's what's gonna happen. I'm going to give you some medicine. You're gonna get rid of the lead that you have in your bloodstream. It's gonna work really well. Well, it takes a long time to do that. And in fact, as women, as anybody, but we have our lead sores that you've heard in our bones. And because there's such turnover during pregnancy, you need that to make it the fetus. You're actually leaching out all the lead that's actually already in your bones. So it's kind of a continuing process. Chelation <coughs> therapy is not without risk. I mean, what it does, it takes out the lead, but it also takes out some of the good things in your body, like calcium. And there's certainly been deaths reported from hypocalcemia in uh, lead-exposed women who've undergone uh, chelation therapy. And when are you supposed to do this? It's really considered an emergency of greater than 70. I think we don't see that all that often. Um, greater than 40, you should really consider it. And in children, it's something similar to that. So diet and nutrition, you know, sometimes we don't spend a lot of time talking about this in a preconception counseling or at the first prenatal visit, but it really is important. And obviously it's important for so many different things, but you know, it's also very important for lead exposure during pregnancy. So if you eat small frequent meals, yes, everybody knows about that for nausea and pregnancy, but it's also really helpful because it gets, the lead gets less absorbed through your system. And then eating a high calcium diet is also very helpful because you're, you're not leaching out as much from, from your own source. So whatever you already have kind of stays where it's, where it's at. And then certain things have been associated with health since such, such things like zinc and vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin E, sort of decrease the absorption of lead. So then lead exposures and breastfeeding, I, this is sort of the area that's a little bit frustrating to me because um, the number one thing people talk to you about postpartum, you know, you care that they're doing well, they want to have a fever, you want to send them home, you know, day two, day three, and all they really want to talk about is their breastfeeding, right? It's like the, it's the number one thing they want to talk to you about. And we have so little information when it comes to breastfeeding, so much even less than when we have in, in pregnancy. Um, but what are you supposed to do is you're supposed to screen women again, just like you're screening anybody in pregnancy, and decide whether or not you should do a lead level. And then you should let them actually breastfeed because we think that the effects of the good effects of breastfeeding are even better than the lead exposure that is less than 40. Um, if you're anything above that, you can consider pumping and dumping sort of to keep that maternal supply. And then the calcium supplementation, again, making sure that the supplementation that you're taking during pregnancy, you kind of keep forward uh, postpartum as well. All right, so these are my references for this. There's a lot more that actually I used, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about this. But I feel like I have another case if you each have time. Or you give people a break. Or? Okay, great. Yes. Does it cost to run a lead level? Why do we go through screening? Everybody? We're going to run RPRs on everyone once we Right. Yeah, you know, I often ask that question. I didn't ask that question before this talk. It's a mistake. I don't actually know how much a lead um, level cost. You know, it's managed. Does anybody, not, so somebody needs to be on lead too.
like what things make it into that first panel of blood that we do. I mean, there's a lot of fight that we, you know, it's like Nara Green, he, he talks a lot about like being the CSH at the, at the first prenatal visit, and there's a lot of backlash on that, and that actually may be cost-effective too, but people, you know, it's really hard to get practices, you know, going. It's, it's, you know, I think everybody should have this test. Um, we're finding that also now with council sort of doing a screening for all the genetic disorders, whether or not that's cost-effective, we're actually doing it on everybody. We're doing it on our clinics in New York, so. So if you test right. somebody preconception or at the new OB right. visit, you may not accurately reflect fetal exposure in the second or third trimester. Kind of like you and I have to write a grant or something, right? <laughs> right? No, but I don't think so. No, you're right. And like how much, and does, I'm sorry, for a second, um, for example, do women racially have a different how much they get from their, their bones, right? I mean, is it different how old we are, how twins, the singletons, uh, at what time of pregnancy, how calcium deficient we are. I mean, I, I'm sure it's like the multifactor, like most all these things are, but that would be interesting to see, right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Mortensen works in the CDC lab that does a lot of the bioanalysis for um, enzymes, among other things. So. Uh, it's, and actually, you're talking about blood lead, because lead is in the red cells. If you, the, the serum, you can't detect the serum. Um, lead level, yeah, it's just a semantic <laughs> issue, but um, just so that it's clear to hold blood lead. And actually, in as long as a woman is reasonably nutritionally replete, um, is reasonably healthy, um, and doesn't have recent exposure, as Jerry mentioned, there's a, a steady state established between what's in bone and what's in blood. So it's, it, and through pregnancy, I'm not actually familiar if anybody is, no, serial blood lead during that's pregnancy, that's how they vary. Uh, yeah. This, I'm Deborah Corey Slocket from the University of Rochester. Blood lead clearly goes up during pregnancy. There are a number of individuals who have in fact humans over time, same thing happens in animal models. Um, that lead is passed uh, directly onto the fetus, so the fetal levels would be exactly the same as the maternal levels, just like the cord blood levels are. Um, it goes up because you are leaching calcium out of bones. It remains high during breastfeeding because the calcium requirements are higher during breastfeeding and 
pregnancy. So it continues up until the end, and that, again, is directly contact with the baby. So there are studies that look at that. Sorry? Would it be in the mid-trimester, like when you've got quad streaks? Well, beginning, maybe. From my point of view, if you want to know ahead of time what a bone lead looks like before pregnancy, right? Because otherwise you have no way to tell whether it's going down. The exposure thing is interesting. A lot of the people who are found to have high levels of, of lead are found to have high levels of mercury and arsenic, too. So that's one of the things that we can also model in some of the epidemiology, but also something we have to think about. What else? No? Should I go on? All right, let's do, let's do the, the next clinical case. <coughs> All right, so. 41-year-old, gravid 1 0 0 16 weeks and 2 days, IVF of C's pregnancy, comes to the ER because of right side of abdominal pain. You sort of do your history and physical exam, your laboratory testing, and you're still not sure exactly what she has, you're still worried about an epidural appendicitis. What are sort of the imaging that you should do? So you all know how to do, all how to do it and, and what you should be doing, and most of the, the <coughs> clinicians follow this paradigm of doing an ultrasound first and MRI next and getting to a CT scan last if we can get the answers to something that has uh, the, the least amount of ionizing radiation for, uh, for the patient. So well, I hated this when I was in biochemistry, but I remember the teacher now saying at the podium saying, you have to know your units, you have to know your units, and it's true here, unfortunately, also, you have to know your units. And uh, sometimes when you're trying to advocate for your patient and you're discussing something with the radiologist, or discussing something with an ER attending, you know, really need this CT scan done, I realize that this is, this is the risk, and you need to know what you're talking about, and then you can say um, something in your armamentarium that can help you get the right thing for the patient. Well, so Siebert is, is a measure of public exposure um, to radiation. That's one of the things that we use. Um, however, the most common things, and you know this already, is using the gray and the rad. And these are some of the conversions there of what the gray and the rad are. So how much is really too much of exposure uh, in during pregnancy? And there's a couple of different regulatory bodies that talk about this. In ACOG, we, they say um, five rads is sort of the, the limit, and how they come up with that threshold is, is looking at uh, what are the effects of force above that and below that, knowing that it's probably more of like a linear exposure of things. And then in human exposure, when it comes to radiation, really most of the information we have is from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You probably all know this. The amount of radiation and the type of radiation that is there is very different from the radiological radiation that we are exposed to as patients. Um, and most of the exposures have resulted in things like microcephaly and growth restriction in these fetuses, and it looks like that big time is really between eight and 15 weeks of gestation. So uh, again, based on autonomous survivors, and then why you really need to know about this is because your patient's gonna ask you about it, they're gonna be scared about it, and because there's a lot of litigation about it, and you really should be doing the right thing for your patient. So uh, what is the exposure? There was a study out there that looked at an exposure of traveling, um, and really in the worst case scenario, and this really is the worst case scenario, it's probably the highest numbers we can find, is that there's about six millirads if you take one flight, let's say between Miami and Toronto, and if you take a flight between Toronto and Frankfurt and come back, probably the exposure is about 25 millirads. So we are exposed 
just on a daily basis, just by living on Earth, we actually have one millisievert of exposure during our pregnancy. You know, this is pretty insignificant, right? But you know, you can't leave, so I mean, this is sort of the way it is. But what are sort of the additional exposures that you're going to be able to um, account for? Well, we talk about uh, chest X-ray. Really, nobody really cares about that anymore because the amount of exposure is limited, especially if you protect uh, the abdomen. And then going down, you can see that it increases, and CT abdomen is, you know, the highest, and that's what we worry about if you're looking for a appendicitis in this particular patient. Well, the thing that's interesting is that CT is changing on a daily basis, and in fact, we're talking about now at Columbia, um, just on a, on a conference call on Wednesday, about doing CT scans on all the patients who have a possibility of a fetal lethal um, skeletal dysplasia. So if you look at an ultrasound, you're like, this, need, this might be thanaphoric dysplasia or something of the sort. It could be a lethal anomaly. You know, let's find it more answers. You can offer a CT scan. You're like, my goodness, CT scan? It's like 3.5 bad. You know, I'm not so sure. I mean, it's limited, but it's going to change the difference. Well, you can actually modulate your parameters on a CT scan to have even lower radiation. So the, radi the radiation is way less than um, even half a rad. And so we're considering doing that as an option for uh, not only for really research, but really actually for clinical clinical use. There, are, there are actually centers that do this. And I want to say just chalk. <coughs> you can. There, there are centers here in the northeast that actually have already started doing this. So with CT techniques, it's a radiation that's dosed that is, uh, for the fetus is very variable. It has to do with so many things, parameters on, on your CT scanner uh, that your radiologist will know. I'm sorry, I will not. Uh, depending on the gestational age and the parameters, are really anywhere between you know, 10 to 15 micrograms. And then PNS effect, uh, we think, just from like the old data, and how correlated is this, how can we correlate this, I don't really know, but 8 to 15 weeks would sort of be that magic number. Um, and then of course it really matters where you're gonna do that CT scan, where is that beam really going to, uh, and how that affects your fetus. What we're really worried about is, is the cancer risk. I mean, that's sort of the, the, probably the thing that comes up the most, and, and possibly the most real. Uh, which is that it does have a, a cancer risk in, in the, that particular pregnancy and that fetus that is born in terms of child. And that risk is quantifiable, and Robert Brent talked a lot about this uh, a few years back, which was that the risk maybe of leukemia is one out of 3,000, maybe as a baseline, and then it would increase to one out of 2,000. That's not an insignificant risk, and when I count the patients on CT scans, that's sort of the one number that I'll actually I'll present. Um, and then, like, just sort of moving back, ultrasound, we think about ultrasound as really, we use it all the time, it's, it's not really a problem. But what there is, a, it's a, a difference is when you use Doppler modality in ultrasound. And Doppler is really pulses that are reflecting off of moving interfaces, so things like blood cells. And this is a sample of a ductus venosus in a fetus, which looks at the blood flow through the ductus venosus, and you can use that for a multitude of different um, screening modalities, such as twin to twin syndrome. And what you're doing is, is um, you're increasing the, the problems that could potentially occur just by using ultrasound. Um, now this is what ultrasound and Doppler are specifically used for, and some of this data is old. I mean, you're not really supposed to listen to the fetal heart rate, at least by AIUM guidelines in the first trimester, and because there's this potential risk of Doppler. Um, you can look at the ductus venosus. In fact, Nicolaides, this group out of the UK, published uh, nice papers that came out in the area like, I think, 2000 something, early 2000s, which is looking at the ductus venosus as part of your um, first trimester screen. And you can put that together to decrease your um, false positive rate. Um, you can look at the tricuspid valve. You can imagine how hard this is to do for Doppler and a tricuspid valve of like a 12 week fetus. But if you, could, if you have good sonography, you can really do that. It can actually reduce the amount of, um, what well, we can tell you how, more about the trisomy 21 fetuses in that pregnancy, or the potential for trisomy 21 in that pregnancy. We look at cardiac physiology. What's really popular now is trying to do fetal echoes in people who have a higher risk of cardiac anomalies. We're trying to do those fetal echoes really early on in the first or the beginning of the second trimester, not really even waiting till 19 or 20 weeks where they're normally done. Um, again, cardiac physiology, uterine um, arteries, and then the evaluation of mono di quin, which is you know it's part of the Quintero staging, which we still use as stage three of mono di um, twin to twin transfusion syndrome and having those Dopplers elevated. So we use Doppler a lot. Um, and so this is a, just like a key on that um, first trimester screening study and what the ductus venosus can help you, can help you do.
And then what are the indices that are important when you're doing ultrasound? And this is sort of just the basics. Um, most of your machines, or they should be, actually um, calibrated so that you don't go above these indices, which are considered unsafe in, in pregnancy or theoretically unsafe. Uh, the mechanical index is an on-screen on indicator, so you'll find it um, usually on the value sign on the right upper quadrant of your screen. Um, uh, likelihood of ultrasound that we reduce the type of cavitation, which has to do with bubbles, air bubbles, and we don't have a lot of that in the fetus, so we don't worry about this as much. What we talked a lot about was something called a thermal index, and the thermal index is also an on-screen indicator, also located in that, um, in the upper portion of your screen, which is the relative potential that it can cause a temperature rise. Um, and we like to keep those indices below one. And so using B and M mode, which is usually what you do when you do ultrasound and, and triage, that's sort of not really the concern. The concern is more of the Doppler. And then these are sort of the, the timing, because uh, it all has to do with exposure and time. In teratology, everything has to do with gestational age, when you actually do it, and then the time the actual fetus is exposed. And this is nothing, uh, it's the same. So looking at a, a thermal index that's less than 0.5, it doesn't really matter, or thought to be not really of any clinical significance. And then when you go above that, it has a time limit. Most of the evaluations are done in far less than that. Uh, but I'll tell you, we do a lot of twin to twin cases um, at Columbia, and sometimes these patients are scanned for an exceptionally long time. Now, you don't use Doppler for 30 minutes, but you do Doppler a lot. In fact, every two weeks they're coming in for their Doppler evaluation to see if they're going to be upstaged to uh, another stage in cesarean staging so that you can actually do something about or potentially offer them laser therapy. So what's really concerning is that a lot of us don't know about this. Um, it's a very simple concept. I'll teach you on my first day of, of, a, of a school for you know, ultrasound. But we don't really know about it. And the studies that were done um, was looking at how many patients, how many providers, doctors, sonographers, midwives, know actually about um, these indices. And only about 28% of them knew it. And ISWAG, which is the international ultrasound um, group, that got a little bit better numbers, but it's just only a little bit over half. And then 22% in this other study and 44% in ISWAG that actually knew how to adjust your energy output. So if you're using ultrasound, you're using alpha, you should really know what those indices mean and how to adjust them if necessary. All right, um, the very last slide that we should up into discussion and questions is that there's a lot of safety um, information out there and a lot of statements that are, are, are brought up. And these are just some of the things that we had already talked about. No need to repeat them, but this comes to this particular um, statement, but ISWAG has it, AIUM has it, and you go there for guidelines. And I actually recently had to go back to those guidelines because we're doing this fetal heart rate study with Doppler um, and probably having to change our indices of how we're going to look at the patient of looking at just fetal heart rate in the first trimester and not actually using Doppler. <coughs> All right. Questions? not a good modality. MRI turns out to be an incredibly good modality for neuro stuff. So I'll, we, we do a lot of MRI. And we actually recently did um, a study looking at MRIs and uh, different anomalies and what you can, act, what, what shows up, what it correlates with ultrasound. And it looks like where we get more information with MRIs with the neuro stuff. With skeletal stuff, you just don't get any information. No, no great additional information. So you really need a CT modality to do that. But again, those that radiation exposure, if you make the protocol correct and they exist and they're published, um, you can actually, that radiation is, is really, really, really small. Or it is, at least in published data. So we're looking in that and see if what the effect is. Yes? I have a question for you, really. We're both at Columbia. I've never met you. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, it's, it's not my actually looking thing to do today to introduce myself to you. I'm actually <laughs> taking the FE like 6400 course, <laughs> which is FE 101. Um, at Columbia, at, at the Mailman School. Yeah, so it's part of my it's part of my fellowship. Okay. Well, but yes, I'm actually take my molecular epidemiology <laughs> course in the spring. But but um, quick question. So we we have these newsletters and tip sheets that we have been leaving off at prenatal clinic, and in, and also with some of the OBGYN docs. But I don't think you've ever seen them. What is the best way that we can get those to you? Because you could hand these. They're, the, the tip sheets were small in Spanish and English, and they were made, you know. Yeah, I think actually I, I've spoken to, uh, you know, Ronald Wapner? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we have a connection there, so I think we'll talk about that and how we can get that out there too. You know, isn't that amazing? You work in the same institution, yeah. and you like this is this is the problem, right? Like somebody's doing all this research, and then the clinician's like, I don't know about that. I don't have, you know, I don't have the resources for my patient. I mean, this is this is the the whole the whole issue. So okay, well we'll work with 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 him, with him and with and him. hopefully with, and with you to see if we can get those into your head because you're still asking yourself to be experts in so many things, have so many skills in one problem. So to speak. Everything and usually right. for skull dysplasia, I, I don't think we use it as much. But I mean, everybody gets an MRI. But it's kind of interesting, you know. It's nice because at Columbia, if you're interested in a center like that, you can you have somebody who does that. And it's apparently really hard to get somebody who reads fetal MRI. Um, and somebody who's this is a problem also at Columbia. Somebody who's funded to do so. I mean, who's going to pay this person who's going to read your MRI? Um, and then you know, where I used to work before, some of my MRIs went to to children. We didn't have, a, nobody in, in our institution in W read fetal MRIs, at least when I was there, right? And so if I had something that, well, I don't really know what that is, an ultrasound, I, you know, we kept doing ultrasounds, but unless we can get her to get an MRI in a timely fashion. And this is at NBC, right? Anything else? Yes. Yeah, sure. So some of the thermal risk it has to do with increasing temperature wise. Um, most of that risk has to do. It's interesting. Like we're really worried about Doppler in the first trimester when there's actually not a lot of bone formation, where you can actually cause some uh, damage, the actual thermal damage, like burns potentially in the fetus. And you worry about it in the first trimester, but really your ossification is happening even later. So, like my interest is thinking like, well, we're doing a lot of Dopplers on babies who are 28, 30 weeks gestation when they have more bone. I mean, is that potentially more damaging than the first trimester where you actually don't have that um, interface? But yeah, it's a thermal damage. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.